Okay, welcome. We're going to get started. Uh, thank you everyone for being here this afternoon. I'm Mary Foyter. Hi, I think I'm at the top of the screen. Uh, I am the VP of Community Engagement for AIGA Chicago, and I'm going to be presenting with Rachel Dikas. And I first met Rachel a few years ago at an AIGA event that our team hosted, uh, De Designing for Social Impact. Uh, since then, I've mostly been following her online, um, but when we did meet, I, I didn't realize that trauma was actually this common thread in both of our work. Um, Rachel's design and social work background is built upon trauma-informed principles. And my interest in trauma-informed design was born out of working on projects in the mental health and reproductive justice-centered spaces. Um, we'll dig deeper into our backgrounds in a few minutes uh, and do some longer introductions and talk about how we got here. Uh, for now, I just want to welcome everyone and walk through a couple quick logistics to let you know a few things about how the session is going to go. Um, first off, this session will be recorded. And is it being recorded? Let me see. Let's check. It's being recorded. Excellent. Okay. Uh, and it's also going to be closed captioned. So we've enabled uh, closed captioning and uh, Catherine has posted in the chat some instructions on where you can find that in your navigation bar. You can turn on that closed captioning. Um, Next, I want to thank uh, Nacho Montiel for the beautiful illustrations uh, that you've seen on our social media and in this presentation. I also want to thank our team of amazing volunteers, Catherine, Leslie, Sam, and Nicolette, and all the folks from the AIGA board who supported this work with their technical know-how. Lastly, I want to make a land acknowledgement. Um, out of respect, we'd like to acknowledge that our virtual event is being held on these traditional ancestral lands. We'd like to pay our respects to elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land and the communities of people that have called it home throughout generations. This community, like so many others, is here because many generations of people who have contributed their hopes and dreams to building a shared history, and that brings us to this moment, to today. So here's a little bit about how it's going to flow today. First off, Rachel and I will share a little bit more about our backgrounds and how we come to this work. We'll share some definitions of trauma and what it means to be trauma informed. And lastly, we'll talk about how trauma shows up in our design work. So during design research, uh, in our design teams and in the actual designs themselves. Uh, then what we're going to do is, is like, we wanna make sure we have lots of time to take questions from all of you. Um, and share some takeaways. Uh, so those Q and A's, that's gonna happen sort of once we get through the presentation, but if questions come up for you as we're going along, please copy them into the Q and A or the chat. Our team is collecting those and we will try to answer as many as we can um, at the tail end of the presentation. And with that, I'm going to pass it, pass the torch to my colleague. Great, thanks Mary. So we want to start by having uh, everyone take stock of your surroundings. So look around and notice where you are. Um, what colors do you see? What's the lighting like? Um, if you're inside, what do you notice about the space that you're currently occupying? Um, if you're outside uh, and walking, like what else do you, what else are you seeing and taking in? Um, this is often just such a simple yet really effective exercise for orienting and centering your mind and your body. Um, and in talking about trauma, um, for us, you know, it's really important to note that just sometimes the mere mention of the word trauma might need its own kind of content warning. Um, we're going to be talking about various ways of defining trauma um, and some of the higher level examples of, of a, a wide variety of traumatic events. Um, as well as mentioning some things that are that are specifically uh, related to trauma. So um, a few things, like we encourage you to pay attention to how your body is maybe like reacting or even just re responding to some of the things that you might be hearing. Um, if there are things that you feel like would be helpful to make note of or th things that you might wanna ask us about, I mean, they're like throughout or that, that we can answer at the end, um, like, you know, write those things down. And, um, but we really encourage you to, to pay attention to how your 
how your body, how like the inside of your body and how your mind is reacting to some of the things. And if you need to take a break, um, step away as you need to. Um, everyone who signed up for this will get a copy of their recording. Okay, so this is one of our first definitions of trauma and this is by um, Dr. Gabor Mate. Um, Dr. Mate is a Hungarian Canadian physician with a really robust background in family practice and with a, a, a special interest in childhood development and trauma. Um, a lot of his work really focuses on the lifelong impacts of trauma and that potential that these impacts might have on our physical and mental health including on autoimmune disease, cancer, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, addictions, and a wide range of other conditions. Um, in this quote, you can see that Dr. Mate says that trauma is what happens inside of you as a result of a traumatic event. It is a loss of connection to oneself in the present moment. So we sometimes think that trauma like is the event or is the experience, but trauma is actually what happens to us after that event has occurred. So we, we have a few polls um, that we're going to have and that will pop up um, throughout the presentation. And the first one is just to really um, just answer like, how confident do you feel um, currently, like in this moment with responding to trauma if or when it shows up in the context of design? So do you feel like not at all prepared? Do you feel hopeful but uncertain? Do you feel fairly confident or are you a trauma expert? So we'll take about, 30, 45 seconds to, uh, to have everyone answer. It looks like we're sharing results and not the poll. So let me just go ahead and, um, uh, there, there we go. It's up now. Hmm. This is fascinating to see live as people are responding. So it looks like most people have voted. I think we have a couple folks on the phone, so they might not be able to actually access the voting. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and end the poll. Okay, and we'll share the results. Yeah, so it looks like um, about 14% feel like not at all prepared. Um, uh, and that's okay, we're glad you're here. Um, vast majority, about 73% hopeful but uncertain. Um, and about 14% fairly confident, which is, uh, it's, that's uh, good to see. So we'll, um, we'll, we're gonna do a similar poll to this um, closer to the end. And so we'll see how this, uh, how this might shift um, throughout the next couple of hours. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about where Mary and I are each gonna take some time to, to talk a little bit about um, ourselves and some of the work that we've done, how we've kind of come into this work as well. Um, so the, the first thing about me is that I'm a social worker. Um, I got my MSW back in 2010 after about a decade of working in the nonprofit sector, um, primarily here in the state of Illinois. Um, and it was during my MSW that I had this chance meeting with the founder of the Champaign-Urbana Design Org, um, where I later joined the board and I helped organize um, a handful of these one-day design events that were for and with local nonprofits. Um, after I graduated with my MSW in 2010, I started working at Veterans Affairs and my first job there was as a patient advocate. This was hands down uh, the most difficult uh, paid job I have ever had and probably ever will have. Um, it was at the VA, though, where I learned where what it really meant to truly work in this multi and transdisciplinary way. Um, I spent nearly seven years there and with the last four being uh, pretty focused on um, construction projects and advocating for homeless and housing insecure veterans. I also want to mention that um, that I'm a mom and this is a photo of me holding, a, you know, this giant target coffee cup that says, um, you know, mom fuel. And it makes me look like just like an absolute giant. Um, but my nine year old took this photo sometime last year. And it just for me, it reminds me um, that we all have a unique perspective, depending on 
uh, the point of view that we have, uh, how tall we might be, uh, just our positionality really can impact what we, what we are seeing. Um, and after having so many um, intentional and unintentional run-ins with design, I actually decided to take this plunge and pursue an MFA at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign as part of the Design for Responsible Innovation program. Um, I'm currently in the middle of this program, and it's where I am really studying and focusing and practicing trauma-informed and trauma-responsive design. Um, lastly, um, uh, I think, you know, as if living through a pandemic, um, homeschooling a third grader, and I also have a spouse who works in healthcare, as if all these things weren't enough, um, I really started seeing um, an intention and a purpose to try to channel these energies in both social work and design and started um, a consultancy called Social Workers Who Design. And just by just putting this out there in the universe, I've been connected with um, designers from all over the world and social workers from all over the world who want to, who are curious about this and wanna build some of this work together. Um, you know, I've been inspired for the past few years by, uh, by this certain uh, quote from Lindsay Cochran, who's a fellow social worker and a UX designer. And, you know, in this, in this piece that she wrote on UX design, she talked about um, how social workers see the impact of bad design and bad policies. And this has really helped me to refine how I approach this work, both as a social worker and as a designer and design researcher. So I wanna start off by sharing um, my core values. Um, in social work, we talk about core values, the profession a lot. And for social work, these are dignity, integrity, competence, social justice, and the value of human relationships. But it has taken um, me um, you know, well over a decade to define what my personal values are in this work. Um, I'm a big proponent of self-trust, compassion, and authenticity and nurturing these three so that when I'm um, both professionally challenged or just blatantly disrespected, I have this solid foundation that is just rooted in ground and confidence. Second, as a social worker, I'm always looking at this more macro approach and how systems are connected and how they're dependent on one another. Um, I, I have my clinical license um, here in the state of Illinois. I'm also a certified clinical trauma provider. Um, so with these different areas and ways that I, that I practice, both from a uh, more macro systems level or, mac or micro, more clinical, I really um, focus on this value of how I can get this all integrated. Um, third, as a design strategist and as a researcher, um, I'm always trying to focus and center um, people throughout this lens that I have, this, this duality that I have as a social worker and designer. Um, I'm a member of the Design Justice Network, and I take both a, an anti-oppressive and trauma-responsive approach to my work. Um, Mary and I are each going to share some different significant experiences throughout our professional lives. And I think that um, these, these stories are really um, just hearing us share these with each other in preparation for this. It's really, um, you, can, you can hear and feel like the journey that we've both taken over the past, you know, 10, 20 years in some of this work, some of this before design, but also, you know, like since then. Um, this first experience um, that I'm going to share was while working on anti-death penalty efforts back in the early 2000s. So if you're, um, if you're participating from Illinois or from the Chicago area especially, um, you might recall that there was a moratorium on the death penalty that was issued by the then governor, uh, George Ryan, back in 2002. And um, it, was a, it was a significant event because there had been more men who had been sentenced to death and found innocent and then released than had been sentenced to death and executed. So the consciousness in the country and really around the world was, was just incredibly heightened. So it's pre-social media, stories state stories for months and months and months. Um, and this, this moratorium, it, it halted the state of Illinois from executing anyone who had been sentenced to death and who was on death row. And some of these, uh, some of these men had been on death row, uh, some for like, um, almost as long as I had been alive at that time. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I did in this work was that I worked really closely with a number of faith and religious leaders um, throughout the country, but primarily in Chicago, 
um, organizers, um, surviving family members who had been um, very severely impacted by the disparities in the system. So these were family members who had a loved one who was on death row, but also family members who had maybe lost someone to murder or violence. Um, I spoke at um, a press conferences. I was a special audience guest member on the Oprah show. Um, I worked really closely with um, a wide variety of artists and musicians who wanted to support this cause. And, and all those things are like super exciting and like proud accolades. But when I really look back on this work, it was the, the most impactful piece was meeting um, Mamie Till Mobley, Mobley um, Emmett Till's mom, um, meeting Bud Welch, whose daughter died in the Oklahoma City bombing, and meeting Ross Bird Jr., whose father was James Bird, um, who died in just an absolutely horrific death at the hands of two white supremacists back in 1998. Um, and when I think back to this work, you know, 20-ish years ago at this point, it was their humanity in the face of trauma that has literally impacted my entire life since. This next experience is from working um, with Mercy Housing, which has um, kind of roots in Chicago in the Chicago area. Um, but working with Mercy Housing, um, the Housing and Urban Development and Veterans Affairs on uh, a multi-million dollar housing complex for veterans. Um, this project, which uh, came to be known as a, a Cannon Place, um, it would not have happened without the inclusion of the veteran voice throughout the entire process. Um, we had um, design charrettes and with architects and hospital staff and veterans were at the table and they were in lockstep with us. And I, I mentioned this one because of the just the, the sheer cause, but also the, the, the combination and the collaboration of different people. But because we were a hospital and a federal hospital, we had accreditation. And uh, as part of being accredited in order to be a functional hospital and be an operational and functional program, we had to demonstrate throughout everything that we did, how we were including the person served in all of our work. And uh, so this was, this was baked into how we, how we conducted the services that we did. Um, and this last project that I want to talk about um, just briefly here took place in mid-March 2020 at the start of um, at the start of and at the at the beginning of all that worry with the pandemic. Um, there was a small team from Siebel Center for Design where I worked at the time, um, and we were asked to join a team of engineering faculty and hospital staff um, at our local um, level one trauma center here in Champaign-Urbana to see if we could prototype an emergency ventilator over what what was supposed to be our spring break. Um, and we were trying to see if we could address what was what was known at the time as this anticipated surge in the numbers um, and the known, the well-known shortage of ventilators from around the world. Um, so our team included engineers, medical professionals, designers, and then me as a social worker in design. Um, this ventilator ended up um, getting picked up by tech giant Belkin from mass production last summer. So um, as, a, as a social worker in design, and I say this a lot, I say like social worker in design, I'm trying to get more comfortable by I, almost identifying as a social worker and design researcher. And, and I think about what it's, what's, that, what's that fusion of those two things. Um, but as a social worker in design, the word empathy is, is not a new one to me. Um, this comes up um, often in social work practice. It, um, there was one year I tracked to see how many times the word empathy was used in social work applications and it was every single one. Um, but I found myself at times just being taken aback at, um, at just the way that I thought empathy was, you know, like feeling for others and it, sometimes it just felt more extractive as opposed to um, like relational. Um, and this has often made me wonder, like, if, if the kind of empathy that we um, more, maybe more often than not practice in design is just like just simply transactional. Um, so when I look at design, I rarely use the word like empathy. Um, I really try to contextualize like, the way that I approach this work as like as being much more with compassion. You know, compassion involves empathy, but it also has this additional like purpose and action behind it. And I feel like it just gives it a, a stronger foundation. Um, but even with this, and even with this said, this often makes me wonder like, you know, how are we, how are we being relational when we're doing this work? So um, I say this not to be a like, you know, social workers have it down and like, we know what we're doing, but it's more of a, how are we, how can we learn from one another as we're doing this?
I guess so it's my turn. <laughs> um, okay, well, hi, I'm Mary. Again, that's me. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I guess I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my background and how I come to this work as well. Um, so I run my own business, I, a micro design consultancy, if you will. For about the past five years, I collaborate daily with clients and other designers on a range of topics and design challenges. Um, however, quite a bit of the work that I do has been focused in public health, particularly sexual health. Um, and whenever possible, uh, my process includes um, co-designing with people or community. Previously to working for myself, I spent a decade plus at IDEO, which is a large design consultancy uh, around here. And uh, in my last role there, I led the communication design team at the Chicago office. While I was at IDEO, I worked primarily with a lot of large corporate um, a large corporate clients, you know, there were smaller jobs as well. Um, there were some nonprofit work, which I will actually share one of those projects. But in my own work, um, in contrast, I primarily work with smaller clients, local government or mission driven and nonprofit organizations. I also want to just note that for the past three years, I've served as the VP of Community Engagement on the board of the Chicago chapter of AIGA, welcome, um, where I lead the design community in developing programming around issues that we're passionate about, both as designers and humans. Uh, this June, I'm actually passing the torch to Nacho Montiel, who's going to be taking over the community engagement um, uh, mantle and um, passing the torch. and. Nacho actually also happens to be the very talented human that created the look and the illustrations for the presentation today. And I'm a mom too. So I'm a mom to a creative, fierce, feisty nine-year-old who is seen here dressed as a werewolf. Um, and I do all sorts of mom things this past year. Um, I don't know, I, I can't see you all, but I, I feel like probably some of you might raise your hands. Um, this past year has been adjusting to a lot of things, including the holy hell, which is remote school while working full time. I loved how Rachel had organized um, her thoughts and core values into uh, three circles. And so I tried to do the same thing, only I didn't take 10 years to ruminate on my core values. So I'm gonna shoot from the hip. Um, I'm still maybe trying to distill mine, but I wanted to share a few things that are really important to me here. First of all, I believe in collaboration and that good design is participatory. Co-designing with people who will, will be directly impacted by the outcome of the work um, is the right thing to do. And my role as a designer is to bring people into the process and amplify their voices. Um, authenticity means owning who I am and how I show up in my work and life as, um, as a 40 something cisgendered straight woman, um, straight white woman, um, I should never assume that I speak for the experience and opinions of others. However, with curiosity and creativity, I can help to design a forum where others can be heard and valued and able to contribute to designing their own experience. Um, my work does require me to be, have some awareness of myself and trust myself and lean on my intu in, intuition at times. Um, and I also just wanted to add that I really believe that by not being scared or being scared and, and working with the fear, um, I, I can, you know, like I'm scared right now talking to you all, <laughs> this makes me nervous, but um, you know, it, it's okay to be vulnerable. And if with vulnerability with others, you can sort of strive to strip away that pretense. So I'm trained and still do work as a graphic designer among other things. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I do believe that the skills that we learn as visual designers, uh, great storytelling, visual clarity, systems thinking, etc. These are all great problem solving tools. And I think they really gave me a strong foundation to learn and grow from as I started to stretch into some of these other areas. And these days, I often refer to myself as a transdisciplinary designer. Um, meaning that my work crosses multiple disciplines and I wear a lot of different hats, be that graphic design, service designer, brand strategist, or design researcher. It really depends on the challenge at hand and who I'm collaborating with. Um, and I also know enough that sometimes I need to bring in like someone who's even more specialized than me um, 
to to collaborate with on on certain things. And I'm, I love being able to collaborate with other designers, um, especially other experts. Um, also, I wanted to mention just that my experience has given me a fierce belief in reproductive justice. Um, and reproductive justice, if you haven't heard of that term before, Sister Song, who really coined the term, uh, defines reproductive justice as a human right to maintain personal body, bodily autonomy, to have children, to not have children, and to parent, the chil to parent children that we have in safe and sustainable communities. And all of these things uh, for me have also really what has led me into, into um, believing that good design must be trauma-informed. So I'll also talk about a couple projects. I'm gonna take a sip of water. So my understanding of a trauma-informed approach really comes from working on different projects and, and working on some of these things. Um, I'm not formally trained in medicine or mental health care. And the things I'm sharing in this presentation are based on my experience as a designer working with professionals in trauma-informed spaces. Obviously, this is very different than my colleague, Rachel, who as a social worker is actually licensed and um, certified in trauma-informed practices. But I do I do think it's really interesting that we both like when we started talking, we both realized we kind of are getting to some of the same beliefs um, from different directions where Rachel came to design through social work. I'm sort of learning more about social work through design. Um, so the first project I wanted to share is um, Bedsider and this is an old project. So I first started working in the sexual health space while I was at IDEO in the Bay Area, this, was, this project was about 13 years ago, um, well before I knew anything about what it meant to be trauma informed. Um, and while working with uh, this client that they were called the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy, uh, now known as the Power to Decide, um, we worked with them to create Bedsider, which is a birth control support network. So this project was actually a game changer for me and that's why I like to mention it because it was the first time that my personal passion um, in this in, in in my life like outside overlapped with my design work. Um, and this was also the first time that I came face to face with trauma in my work as a designer. Um, and I knew that I was unprepared. And I really, this experience of working on this project um, helped me to start to recognize the need for something more. Um, so in the years that followed, I've collaborated with a number of trauma-informed organizations. Um, one of these uh, in Chicago here, um, I've been work I have worked with the Chicago Department of Public Health on and off over the past five years uh, on the Chicago Healthy Adolescent and Teens Program. Um, this is a education in school program that's a collaboration between Chicago Department of Public Health Planned Parenthood of Illinois, Chicago Public Schools Health and Wellness Team, um, and this, they all work together to bring uh, STI education, which is sexually transmitted infection uh, education and free um, anonymous testing and treatment to young people in schools during the school day. Um, they have a, a team that goes in and gives a presentation and, and leads things. So for this project, um, it was really important when when this was um, first proposed to us, they were thinking about the way that this whole thing came together. What was the journey of the young person um, and what did it look like? We started with just a presentation um, and for this project, we partnered with a cohort of young people uh, from the Mikva Challenge, which is a youth leadership organization here in Chicago. Um, to co-design everything from content that young people felt was they desired and was missing from their sex ed uh, to, to the look and feel and voice of the brand and presentation, uh, that tone of voice of which things were delivered. Um, I collaborated with a team at the CI3 Design Lab at the University of Chicago. So CI3, I'm not even gonna try to, to, to say all the words that uh, CI3 stands for because I didn't write it down. It's the Center for Interdisciplinary Inquiry and Innovation in Sexual and Reproductive Health. I'm looking at Catherine's uh, You nailed it, Mary. Light up. I did, I did it because Catherine <laughs> yeah. and I worked together there. <laughs> um, 
So their focus is on uh, adolescent sexual health. And so I collaborated with a team there to develop a program together to co-design with teens to prototype and create adolescent centered sexual reproductive health services and tools to support, um, support them and their agency over their bodies and their care. So um, understanding how to work with young people and then to navigate the sexual reproductive health care in a trauma informed way. And then the last project I want to mention that is, is one that um, I've worked a client that I've worked with for over the past couple of years and am currently working with that's very close to my heart is um, have been collaborating with a startup nonprofit that uh, right now is known as the PRISM, P-R-I-S-M project. Um, and we are working on naming and branding that in, in the coming months. But uh, this is a startup that's building digital tools to support survivors of sexual assault and abuse. Um, in 2019, we spent time with survivors uh, of, of sexual abuse and assault, um, as well as providers who support them and began to under to just to try and start to begin to understand the needs of, that a young adult survivor might face when they're going out onto their own and how we can start to support them with tools. So these projects I mentioned and other projects have really given me an opportunity to work side by side with trauma-informed care providers and professionals. Um, and through this experience, I've started to incorporate those trauma-informed principles and methodologies into my own work. So we're gonna talk about just what is trauma? Um, and Mary, if you can go to the next slide. So I wanna set up the context for this two minute clip that we're about to share. Um, this is from the On Being podcast. It's hosted by Krista Tippett, and it's part of an interview that she did with uh, Resma Menachem. Uh, Resma is a social worker, a somatic abolitionist, trauma specialist, and he's the author of My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma and the Pathways to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. Um, a few other things to, to note about this. Um, if you haven't listened to this podcast or this full interview uh, before, uh, this originally aired uh, back in early 2020, so it was it was within a matter of days after the murder of George Floyd back on um, May 25th, 2020. Um, and I note this significance because both Resma and Krista live in Minneapolis. Um, another thing that I want to note is that they recorded this interview in January 2020. So this was pre-pandemic, and they recorded it in person. So um, in this clip, and also if you, we'll include this in the resources at the end, if you, if you listen to this full interview, um, you can really, you can tell that they are in the same space. Um, there are moments when Resma actually uh, points out that um, Krista was, uh, looked, looked uh, like visibly nervous um, or anxious, um, that she was turning beet red during some of the conversation that they were having just about trauma and racialized trauma. Um, uh, I think, you know, I, I think it's important to just, you know, listen as closely as you can and pay attention to the ways that they interact with one another. Um, at the very start of the clip, um, you'll hear Krista Tepet um, let out this very like audible exhale um, before they start transitioning. And this is only about, you know, this, the, the, the full length interview is well over an hour and they're only about like maybe 10 minutes into this, um, the, the interview so far, but also pay attention to and listen to how Resma describes trauma and what trauma means when it's actually decontextualized. So I want to back up a little bit and talk about your particular way into this mm -hmm. with the focus on the trauma yeah. uh, that is actually in all of us. Yeah. And you're working with realities that are as old as the human brain and body, but very new science. Yes. And so I'm curious about, um, so, you know, it's the science of trauma. I mean, PTSD, everybody knows that now, but it's just a couple decades That's old. Right. Yeah, right. The whole uh, field of epigenetics about how trauma and resilience get, can cross generations. 14, there's, there's, I just read somewhere it says 14 generations. 14, right. So this is all new. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you say, it 
it's new information that lands like, oh, of course we knew that all along. Yeah, yeah. it's always been there. It's, there's always been this kind of uh, resonance knowing um, that something's there. Haven't, because it's been decontextualized and handed down from my mom, my grandmother, my grandfather, blah, 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 all the way yeah, down. Yeah. I didn't have a language, but there was a knowing that this ain't right. Um, that a lot of that they lived through a lot of trauma. Not just that they lived through trauma, but that the angst and the anguish was decontextualized. Right. And so now, so for my black body to be born into a society mm -hmm. by which the white body is the standard is in and of itself traumatizing. Right. If my mom is born as a black woman into a society that predicates her body as deviant, the amount of cortisol that is in her nervous system when I'm being born right. is teaching my nervous system something. Right. Right. Trauma decontextualized in a person looks like personality. Trauma decontextualized in a family looks like family traits. Trauma in a people looks like culture. I've, I've said this to Mary, I don't know how many times, I probably have listened to this interview easily two dozen times, like the full interview two dozen times at this point since the first time I heard it. And um, and that clip and then the way that the music, like <laughs> the editing of this is just so powerful. And this this understanding and this learning about trauma um, it, it might be new for, for a lot of you who are attending today. And for me, when I think back over, you know, this work that I did, you know, against the death penalty, um, like uh, being a social worker for over a decade at this point, all of the required trainings and the various certifications and so many of the different definitions that I've come to just apply in my own work over the, over the past 20 plus years. Um, it's like, the, it's like it all kind of, like fell to the wayside and it, hearing this, hearing this definition of trauma, it just, it has fundamentally changed how I think about trauma in the context of design. And if you just look at that, just the, the first sentence of, of that segment um, of what you see on the screen, like trauma decontextualized and a person looks like personality. I mean, that, I just think about all the times I, talk to someone uh, in passing uh, for work, um, personal conversations, interviews that we've done with people as part of like design projects and the, the, the way that people show up and that they might present and uh, the, the various masks or um, armor that are being put up that may, you know, not always, but may be just traumatic responses. Um, I, I just, I've, I have yet to hear anyone talk about it in this way. And so um, we're going to include that, that full show in, um, in the whole notes. So some additional um, definitions of trauma. Um, I want to talk about, uh, there are three primary um, categories of trauma. Um, the first one is acute trauma, which is uh, pretty focused on a, a single distressing event. So, you know, some examples of an acute trauma might be like a house fire, a car accident, um, an assault. Um, the next is uh, chronic trauma. Um, chronic trauma are, these are events that are multiple, they're long-term and or they're prolonged distressing and traumatic events. And so this could be, um, you know, chronic trauma might include like, you know, a long-term serious illness, um, bullying, living through a pandemic, I think is really being um, often uh, like defined as being like a chronic trauma for certain people. And then the third is a complex trauma. So a complex trauma is really the result of uh, exposure to a, a variety and multiple traumatic events and or experiences. So some examples of a complex trauma might be domestic violence, racism, childhood neglect and abuse, um, civil unrest. On this next slide, you'll see where um, we don't have the time to, to dig deeper into these, but we wanna include some additional um, examples of complex trauma. So environmental, prolonged, racial, 
intergenerational, spiritual, and developmental. And um, there may be, um, Mary and I have talked about doing a, a second, um, much deeper dive uh, version of this that's more of like a workshop based. Um, and we may dig deeper into some of these. Um, I wanna share some things related to like the current state of trauma work. And this is really looking at it from, um, from a more clinical perspective. Um, I believe mentioning um, a few of these things is really worth noting because it gives us this opportunity to maybe make some changes. Um, the first one is this just hyper-focus on the individual versus the community. Um, in, in the clinical work of trauma, there is um, a lot of focus on um, healing or fixing or problem solving the individual as opposed to uh, really shepherding and encouraging this, uh, you know, the potential positive effects of healing in community. Um, this is demonstrated through um, insurance. Um, those who are privileged to have insurance, one-on-one um, -on -one therapy uh, being something that's reimbursable, whereas something that might be um, a group um, session or something like that is just outside of this, this norm of individual treatment um, doesn't get approved. The second is this heavy reliance on the DSM. And the DSM is this, um, you know, almost 1000 page book that I've been resting my arm on. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. We're currently on the, the fifth version. Most social workers who have been practicing for a while absolutely hate this book. Um, I've kept it around because it was kind of gifted to me when I was um, at, the, at, the, at the VA. Um, but this is um, from the American Psychiatric Association. And um, the if, if a diagnosis is not included in the DSM, it significantly impacts um, any kind of expansion of understanding. Um, uh, it impacts like funding and research um, on alternative treatments or just expanding our definition of what trauma may be. This third is this reliance on resilience and grit. Um, this is probably like my, my most frustrating um, thing that I, that I see constantly happen. I, 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 you know, being the recipient of uh, living through so much of this kind of rhetoric throughout the pandemic, um, like, like just be resilient, you know, like we can, like we can, you know, take a bath and bath our way out of like the, the, the complexity of the trauma that we've all been living through, as opposed to actually like looking at the systemic failures of, of the system and of the institutions and really look much more closely at who gets access to care, and who even has the time to, to heal if they do have that access. A couple other things in this arena that we wanna talk about is um, someone who has really looked at the, the systemic failures of trauma and trauma work is Renee Linkletter. Um, her book, Decolonizing Trauma Work from 2014 calls out this really important piece. Um, she says, the term trauma originates from Western contexts, and with a decolonizing approach, it is essential to acknowledge this. Using trauma terminology implies that the individual is responsible for the response, rather than the broader systemic forces caused by the state's abuse of power. This enables government and society in general to circumvent responsibility and liability. Um, this next slide, this next collection of slides is really looking at um, just a, a, a couple weeks worth, two, three weeks work, worth of um, headlines in the news that are either specifically talking about uh, trauma or traumatic event. Um, some of these are, you know, are, will hopefully look um, somewhat familiar. You can see this, uh, this array of different types of traumatic events that are kind of like uh, just captured here. Um, there's one in particular that I want to that I want to like hone in on because um, it it was just it was shocking to read it, um, and you can see it's the headline that's sort of in the middle of the page. It says bones of black children killed in police bombing used an Ivy League anthropology course. Um, what you don't see in this headline, um, as if that isn't shocking and kind of like the, the just distressing enough, is that um, is that they haven't actually been able to identify the specific children um, that uh, that these bones belong to, um, but they know they know for a fact that um, that the parents of these unknown children are still alive. 
um, these bones were used in um, like several courses. So it wasn't just like one and maybe it was like a, you know, an accident of some sort. It was used in several courses, uh, especially on the online platform Coursera. So there are thousands of students who took this course and were just exposed to um, to, to this, to this context. Um, and so it, it makes me think about, you know, this, how traumatizing this is for the surviving parents, how traumatizing it, it may have been for the students in this class, um, how traumatizing it might be to read about this, like decades after this event occurred. So, um, I think just, uh, you know, it makes us think about, um, you know, what, what's the, what's the resolution, you know? And uh, within a matter of days, there was an updated story where there is an apology that was issued by the institutions that had used these, these, these artifacts, these human artifacts. But, um, you know, just think for a moment, like how many hundreds or thousands of people have been impacted by that, by that event and by that class and then by reliving it in the news. I mean, these are the kinds of examples that I think we are constantly um, swimming in and that we sometimes just get desensitized by because the volume is just too much. Yes, oh, so just reading the news, um, reading these things and, and, and being immersed in swimming in these things can be immensely triggering. Uh, and so, you know, imagine being triggered and then stepping, you know, feeling triggered and stepping into a care or design context. Um, it's why it's so important for us to understand the importance of a trauma-informed approach. And so I'm going to, um, we're going to walk through what this, what a trauma-informed approach is. So trauma-informed approach comes from trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed care um, recognizes that traumatic experiences terrify, overwhelm, and violate an individual. And trauma-informed care is a commitment not to repeat those experiences and in whatever way possible to try and restore a sense of safety, of power, and self-worth. But we borrowed this slide from the CDC. Um, these are, there are six guiding principles which define what a, a trauma-informed approach is. Uh, and these are recognized in the healthcare and behavioral mental health spaces. Um, but I think they're super relevant for designers. Um, as a designer, I was super, I was really inspired by these when I first um, encountered them in, in, um, through, through client work. And they feel like design principles. And I started to ask myself, how might we learn from these and think critically about how we want to approach uh, the design process um, that in a way that can better support the people and communities that we hope to serve in a really trauma-informed way. And I think, um, Rachel, you and I were talking about this. I think that the language here is, is when I, we'll go through these um, and talk about each, and the language is really, um, originally intended on the left-hand side, this is like written towards a provider setting. So if it seems a little bit health -y, it's because it is. So the first uh, principle here is safety. Safety is always first. Providers want the people that they serve to feel physically and psychologically safe in our spaces when taking part in services. So what does that mean for designers? Um, when we think about the work that we do as designers, how does our work support a person's sense of physical or psychological safety? You know, how might we establish a safety plan before conducting design research? Um, do we have a plan to connect people to services if they need it? Uh, and how might we create or foster a design environment that, that where someone can feel safe or brave in having these conversations? Secondly, um, is trans trustworthiness and transparency. So operations and decisions, and I'm sorry, I'm just reading slides, but I think it, you know, it's, it's sort of a good way to get it to sink into my brain too. The operations and decisions should be conducted with transparency, with a goal of building and maintaining trust among staff, clients, and family members of those receiving the services. So thinking about trustworthiness and transparency, how are we establishing ourselves as trustworthy? You know, how can we provide more transparency when we're doing design research or when we're, um, we're doing our work? And what does it mean to be transparent in our work? Um, we should start asking ourselves these questions. And, you know, especially are we, are we intention, being intentional about building um, inclusive and diverse teams 
in, in building this. And thirdly is peer support and mutual self-help, which I can never say, mutual uh, self-help. So enabling individuals to involve their peers or the people they care about in their care. Um, so this is crucial both to service de delivery, um, to a service delivery approach and can be a key vehicle for building trust, establishing safety and relationships um, and empowerment. So, you know, how might we involve a person's own network or peers in the work that we're doing if we're co-designing with community? What, what methods or design experiences enable someone to feel supported by others? Or how can they bring others, we can bring the community in um, to the work? I'm going to take these, uh, the last three principles, and the fourth one being collaboration and mutuality. Um, so this is recognition that healing happens through the meaningful sharing of power and decision making. It's involving people in their own treatment planning. Um, and so for a designer, uh, the way the, uh, one way that we can look at this is how might we thoughtfully and ethically involve people in meaningful participatory design or co-design? How might we share or give up power? Um, how might we ensure that we center our collaborators over our funders or our institutions? For the fifth principle, it's empowerment, voice, and choice. So the goal is to aim to strengthen the staff, the client, and the family member experience of choice. Um, recognize that every person's experience is unique and requires an individualized approach to care. So this may speak a little bit against like what I just said a few slides ago when talking about individualistic versus a like community. Um, however, um, it's I think that this could apply to both individual situations and community. But you know, in the context of design, like how are our design processes supporting equity and inclusivity? Um, how are these processes empowering people or fostering a sense of agency in individuals? Are there forms of power that are harmful or that are actually helpful uh, to the individuals that we're trying to center? And in what ways can we am amplify the voices of co-designers or community? And this sixth uh, principle is cultural, historical, and gender issues. So the goal is to avoid cultural stereotypes and biases um, and offer culturally responsive services, leverage the healing value of traditional cultural connections and recognize and address historical trauma. Um, for a designer, how might we design for a commitment to recovery? Um, how might we challenge systems and structures and redesign them or build new ones? How might we address imbalanced power dynamics? Um, who else needs to be part of this work? And do we even have established or trusted relationships in the community? Uh, these, are, these are critical questions for us to ask. This next thing um, is a reference to something that um, Bessel van der Kolk, who's the author of The Body Keeps the Score, um, that he said in a, a training that I did with him in the fall. And the, the context of this is that he was talking about um, uh, you know, a, a, a client um, interaction and, uh, and really was impressing upon the importance for all of us as various uh, kinds of clinicians that, uh, that we need to not focus on, um, on these relationships being us versus them uh, and us having like power over individuals. Um, and then he went on to say explicitly, he said, there is no us versus them, uh, we are them. And this was, I mean, this was all over Zoom, um, but it was like after a, two days of a very, very active chat, um, like no one said anything. It's like, it was, people were just, kind of like stunned to, to really absorb the words of what he was saying and then the effect of that. And just the, that, that whole idea of uh, like sh either sharing power or giving up power, like in that kind of a relationship, I think really it just, it struck me as, as something that was valuable to include here. Yeah, I think, you know, when you told me this story, it just makes me think that, you know, none of us are immune to trauma, um, almost, so many people, almost all of us have experienced trauma of some of some kind, and it does affect people in different ways, but that none of us are, you know, exempt from trauma. I wanted to read this another quote, but uh, this quote, um, I've lost my place. There we go. So on a, um, on, on 
uh, a friend's recommendation. I picked up this book. Uh, just it just arrived in the in the mail two days ago. This uh, book is extra bold and it is a feminist, inclusive, anti-racist, non-binary field guide for graphic designers. Anyway, I got my copy just two days ago and I haven't had time to go through all of it yet. But one of the first things I read when I opened it up was this was an interview um, with Christy Tillman. Uh, Christy is a designer and a change advocate who worked at Slack and also IDEO, although we maybe met, we never, we never actually got to work together. Um, and she says in our professional discourse, we don't really talk about the power dynamics of politics and design, who's making things for whom, what are the processes we're using to make things. Designers are creating culture and we're creating the interface by which people engage with their futures. And it just really struck me that these power dynamics and imbalances are another reason why um, a trauma-informed approach is so relevant. So let's dig into trauma-informed design. Uh, there's really, in broad strokes, I think we can begin by applying trauma-informed uh, trauma-informed approach kind of in three high-level areas of our design work. Uh, the first is to make design research trauma-informed. Uh, we were kind of mentioning different examples when we we're going through the CDC's uh, tool. Um, you know, this. This can really, design research really can apply to any projects. We've probably already been, you know, I think those of, of, of us in this um, webinar who've been on research interviews, either as um, practitioners of design research or as team members who were along uh, to observe, um, at some point we may have no, seen where a participant was very uncomfortable or maybe they told us things that were unexpected or revealing of some kind of trauma they'd experienced, whether that was abuse or grief um, or other things. Um, and if you know your work will be involving survivors of trauma, you wanna be deliberate in how you involve them. So because they have a stake in, in this, not only in what's being designed, but the impact of the research experience itself. And those, you know, that's when we start talking about those intentional and unintentional consequences that we have um, in their lives when we're doing this work. Secondly, we want to hold space for trauma in our teams because we're humans. Um, we want to set the stage for open, uh, safe conversations and recovery when it's needed uh, and avoid vicarious or secondary trauma or re-traumatization for the team. Um, vicarious or secondary trauma is just to define that it's the kind of that emotional residue uh, of exposure that can that um, the helping professionals can have from working with people um, as they're hearing the stories of trauma or become witnesses to the pain and fear and terror of um, that trauma survivors um, have endured. And the third uh, area is, is to design for trauma and recovery. So when we're designing with and for survivors of trauma or, or with those who are navigating their own trauma um, it's important to understand the impacts of that trauma as well as the steps needed for healing for survivors and their journey towards recovery. So this first one is um, make research trauma informed. Um, we really want to think differently, not only about how we conduct our research, but how are we identifying how are we identifying participants and setting the expectations for them. Um, and also, you know, if, if we can, or at least like give the consideration to anticipating the possibility of connecting people with a licensed professional, like if we need to. So if, if things get, uh, uh, you know, too emotional or much too, uh, much too complex, um, this is really, this is something that is uh, really important to pay attention to. Um, I want to share a bit about um, Tad Hirsch, who is a design educator and a professor at Northeastern University. Um, in April 2020, so just barely a year ago, he published an academic paper called um, titled Practicing Without a License, Design Research as Psychotherapy. Um, if I can make this required reading for current design practitioners and for anyone who is uh, a design student, um, I, would, I would make that this a requirement. Um, we'll also include this in our resources after the session today. 
Um, but in this piece, Hirsch talked about how crucial it is for design researchers to not be just performing empathy in order to be um, exploitive or um, gain source material. He emphasized that design research is not and should not mimic therapy. Um, so there are a number of things that he talks about. He talks about the importance and the value of being trauma-informed, um, of including other professionals, like when we're doing some of this work. Um, but there's this particular like, you know, quote that we pulled out um, where he says, a growing number of design research projects intentionally recruit vulnerable participants. Inviting participants to engage in a reflexive project may lead to the revisiting of unhappy experiences. I mean, this is, um, I think this happens more often than we may ever know about. Um, and uh, hopefully we are, have some like heightened awareness of when this has occurred and then trying to reduce that re-traumatization and, uh, you know, intentionally uh, prevent that, um, that, that secondary trauma for our, either our teams or for the people that we're interviewing. Um, we're gonna go into some more specifics of looking at what are some practices that we can, that we can cultivate uh, to have a more trauma conscious um, you know, practice like when we're doing design research. Yeah, so in design research, it's it's really important to build trusted relationships, um, and and you know building those relationships takes time, um, and to the point that Rachel was just making with that quote, um, especially when you're 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 working in a space of trauma, we don't just want to be like mining people for for information. Um, we need to do this in a sensitive way and. Um, uh, especially when you're working in sensitive topics, you wanted to do that from a place, you want to talk to people from a place of trust. So I wanted to share, um, you know, a, a story about the project PRISM that I mentioned um, when I was talking about some things that were meaningful to me. And this is a project that uh, is about designing a digital support for survivors of sexual abuse and assault. And we knew that we were wa we wanted to speak to survivors um, and this meant we had to approach recruiting as well as our research a little bit differently. Um, we knew it was important to reach out and identify, you know, people through trusted partners. And, and so this was actually how we uh, connected with an organization called the Voices and Faces Project. So the Voices and Faces Project's mission is to help survivors of sexual assault and abuse to tell their stories. Um, PRISM's founder is a survivor and had participated previously in one of their writing workshops. Um, and the Voices and Faces team believed in that the value of the work that, that we were doing and agreed to be a partner who could connect the design team to folks who had self-identified as being willing to share their experience of their healing journeys. Uh, and a different project with the University of Chicago we co-designed and collaborated with a group of young people um, from the south and west sides of Chicago uh, to redesign sexual health care, their experience with that sexual health focused doctor's appointment. And for this recruit and, and how, how we were able to connect with young people, uh, the team at, at University of Chicago leveraged trusted local relationships, um, was led by a team member who had lived and worked in the neighborhood. Uh, and we worked with them to recruit young people uh, for this summer design challenge. We collaborated with both schools, local schools and community partners. And then the young people that uh, were invited to participate or out, who, who, who chose to participate were paid um, like it was a summer job because we were meeting over six weeks, a couple times a week. They were paid for their time and they had the option to take provided transportation to and from the co-design sessions. Okay, I just have to say that if you can hear my dog snoring by my feet, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, <laughs> it's such a loud noise. Okay, um, then another way we can cultivate practices when we're thinking about these, these types of conversations, we really need to prepare participants um, during that PRISM project that I had previously mentioned, it was really critical to set expectations to let survivors know exactly how things would go. Uh, in preparing for the interview, we wanted to set expectations about uh, the flow of the conversation. Um, you know, we wanted to, to let them know, um, you know, the types of questions we'd be asking and where we should meet. Uh, for some, we said we could meet in person in a place that they were familiar with. For others, it was a digital conversation. And this was pre-pandemic when we weren't always doing everything in, in Zoom. But um, 
where they could call us from a place where they felt safe and have a trusted person nearby who they could have for support should they need it. Uh, we let them know that the conversation would be centered on their experiences navigating resources and care, not their trauma story itself. We also made it clear that they had the power um, in the conversation to stop the conversation, to refuse to talk about any topic, um, and we could stop at any time. Something else that we tried that was valuable, uh, both to participants and the team, was to start each interview with a bit of a grounding exercise, much like Rachel did with all of us um, at the top of this talk, just to sort of center your awareness on where where we are and and you know um, that we have both feet on the floor that we're in this space together uh, one of my co my colleagues uh, in this project Anna was trained in a form of trauma-informed yoga um, and she would start each session with a short meditation to help participants feel grounded secure and in control and when I say meditation I also want to note that not everyone feels comfortable or safe like closing their eyes in a space with other people or in front of other people. Um, and so, you know, in this, we, we weren't mandating that people participated in a certain way. Um, and, and we would never advocate for that. You want people to choose what's best for themselves. Another way to do this is through um, co-design. So co-design, you know, I think a lot of us might be, um, you know, fairly aware of a co-design and the opportunities to really collaborate with the very people who have a, either a professional or have like a lived experience of what we're designing. Um, and there are, there are a number of great resources on, um, on co-design. This first example is related to the Illinois Rapid Vent project that I was part of. Um, and so we, in that, in that week's worth of time, we had 12 interviews that we did with a variety of medical staff. Um, I helped um, you know, co-create and refine that interview guide with some of the individuals that we actually interviewed. Um, and then I was this main person in personal contact with each person that we did do those interviews with. So I was the lead interviewer. Um, I, I often went off script and kind of went off the interview guide um, because I was really following the flow of the various things that people were sharing. Now, I also had the added advantage of um, a number of the people that we, that we talked to, like knew my spouse because they worked together at the local hospital. Um, however, they, the, the timing of the, the, the sense of awareness that was going on at that time, at the start of the, of the pandemic, um, a lot of people were really worried. Um, we, even in Champaign-Urbana at the time, we had only had maybe one or two confirmed COVID cases. Um, so very different from where we are now. And the, but the nervousness, like the fear of, uh, of this uh, being so highly contagious of people being, bringing this home and maybe their kids getting sick. Um, that was something I had to be very, very mindful of and how I asked certain questions and just how we were conversational throughout that time. So just making sure you're being very gracious before, throughout, and then thanking them for their time, um, like at the end of the interview, but then also like following up with that thank you with a, with a personal note and inviting them to be part of this process or if they had anything else that they wanted to include or share like later. Um, so it was, um, it, it just, it was, it was a, a heavy weight to wear all those different hats, but, you know, I, I, I relied on a lot of my previous VA experience and just being a social worker to really like navigate that, like with a, with a lot of ease. Uh, the last sort of design research story that I'll tell us more about impact. So I just wanted to give a quick example from the project um, with the University of Chicago when we were working with young people to redesign their sexual health care conversation. Uh, young people were able to go through the process um, and, and uh, play act going through appointments and, and also go on appointments if they needed that care themselves. But one of the young, uh, many of the young people observed that the providers often made assumptions about them. Um, they would make assumptions about their age, their bodies, their pronouns, uh, their sexual orientation, um, they, you know, their gender. And uh, so you can see here on the top, a, a tool that was made by one of the young people based on their observations and frustrations with the, this, this project and process and feeling you know, not respected um, in their uh, appointments. And so um, those observations and frustrations were actually turned into training tools for providers. So where providers could be given different scenarios and role play 
trying out uh, different types of conversations that maybe would were, were things that you know made them feel uncomfortable or were unfamiliar and for practice speaking to young people in respectful and inclusive ways. This, um, um, oh, do you want to go? No, go ahead. <laughs> Give you, I'll let you catch your breath. Um, the this second area that we want to talk about is just holding space for trauma in teams, um, especially when we're designing with or for trauma survivors. Um, it's really important to acknowledge that working in a space of trauma just may necessitate new and emerging practices for the way that we do our work, for the work that we do with our teams, and just how we how we do this just operationally. Um, this, uh, this quote here on the next page, next slide, um, is, uh, is, is another from uh, Bessel van der Kolk. Uh, and he says here, he says, we have learned that trauma is not just an event that took place sometime in the past. It is also that imprint that is left by that experience on the mind, the brain, and the body. Uh, this imprint has ongoing consequences for how the human organism manages to survive in the present. So, I mean, almost everyone has experienced um, or has experienced at least one traumatic event um, at some point, and the body and the mind respond to this trauma in different ways. However, like repeated um, traumas such as like childhood abuse, sexual trauma, or war or combat can really leave like huge imprints on the survivors. Um, an estimated you know, 70% of adults in the U.S. have experienced a traumatic event at least once in their lives. Um, and this, this statistic might seem, um, it might seem like too high, it actually might seem like too low. Um, this, this stat is actually, um, it, it's pre-pandemic, this is from 2014. Um, there, there are current studies and research that's being done and that are underway that are to try to assess like what's the percentage of adults in the U.S. who have experienced a at least one traumatic event, uh, at least once in their lives. Um, I'd be shocked if that percentage is not like much closer to a hundred, if not a hundred percent. And it's really, you know, reactions to trauma can really vary widely and they're very individual. They're, they're very much unique. So we wanted to ask one more uh, poll question here that we'll launch. And what we really wanted to just sort of ask this, this space, you know, have you ever encountered trauma at work in design teams or during your design research? Give this another second if I roll one in. It looks like we have, you know, some who just aren't sure, um, which uh, that that makes perfect sense. Um, you know, vast majority have said, like, you know, yes. Yeah. Can you see the results there? Yeah. Hmm. Seventy percent of you said yes. <laughs> So um, trauma does show up in our teams, as, as you just proved, um, and it shows up in our work and our, in our lives. And um, you know, there these are just a, these things that are populating the screen are just a few examples of the ways that we've heard um, or witnessed trauma showing up in our work um, or the work of our teams um, or the teams of colleagues. And and I just want to tell like a, a story uh, as an example. Over 10 years ago, I was working on a project about sexual health and birth control, and I had a young coworker who was right out of college, um, who was triggered, who got triggered during a team conversation. She was very triggered and she felt awful. Um, and it brought up some, you know, uh, memories of, of something that she had experienced when she was younger. Um, she felt awful, but she was unable to communicate her needs to anyone else on the team. And she didn't tell me about this until years later, we were having a conversation. She said, you know, you know, and she recounted the story. Um, and it's just, 
I feel, I mean, it feels awful to know that our team did that, um, that caused that to happen. But I, you know, I think we had no idea of what it, what being trauma informed was. We didn't have any team agreements or safety measures in place to, to sort of be able to navigate that sort of um, thing when it came up. Um, I can also tell you a story that like personally, I've been on some difficult interviews that were incredibly triggering for me as well. Um, but uh, I, I have been able to communicate with team members and have sort of an agreement in place that we could, you know, take a break. And I remember once leaving a research conversation and sitting in my car and crying for half an hour, but that was okay. I'll also, I'll just share, you know, very briefly that I have, I have talked to at this point, it's, it's, it's getting close to a hundred people, just informal conversations, um, people who have in it, who have, who uh, heard me speak at a greater good studios restorative design conference. Um, that was back in October. And I've talked to people all over the world. So designers, design educators, design enthusiasts. Um, and, uh, the this this idea of secondary trauma or how it shows up in our teams has come up in every single conversation every single one someone has brought up um that uh there are just scenarios that they are not comfortable bringing up to either supervisors or leaders within their organizations um that um, issues have come up um personally and they didn't know um who to tell or what they or if they even could or how they would even talk about that or process that um, and then just just the and just the, the the real human effects of just hearing and absorbing other people's stuff. Um, it, it's a uh, it's it's highly prevalent, um, and it is not um, talked about as much um, in design. Um, so it's one of the things that we we like. Mary and I have spent a lot of time just talking about, especially this this number two in this area and in this context, and what are some ways and things that we can really um, talk about this much more deeply and and have some uh, tools and resources and just methods for intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, something we talked about, like it's you know withholding space um, for trauma in teams. It you know it it's a. Uh, you know, you have to really establish some new norms together uh, and build that safety and trust within the team. And a couple things that we were we were talking about, things that you might be able to do. One is it's a good idea, maybe if everyone on the team does some self-reflection before you start that work, um, you can ask yourself, you know, based on what I know right now, do I anticipate something uncomfortable coming up in this project? Are there emotions or thoughts that might impact my performance? Um, what do I need to do to mentally prepare myself for this work? You can ask yourself these questions. And then, you know, are any of the answers that I reflected on on my own, are these things that I might want to discuss or disclose to my team or not, or to, um, you know, to, to someone on the team so that we can look out for each other? Uh, the second example here is, is like a screenshot I took from a recent project kickoff. Um, I maybe changed a few of the things for, for privacy here, but um, this is done, you know, just on a Google Jamboard with some fake Google Jamboard post-its. And, and one way that we can set the stage for a project from the start, and, you know, this speaks to good kickoff practices, internal kickoff practices, but, but it's also a way of um, a, a, an exercise where everyone can voice, you know, their, um, hopes and fears for the project and the work coming up of, that, of, of collaborating together. And, um, and also a place to talk about how different work styles affect the, the, you know, the way that we work. Are you someone who's always on Slack? Are you someone who works at night? I might be, you know, I, I always, um, you know, might get back online later and email people, those sorts of work style things, as well as wellness needs. Like you might be, you know, um, I, I would identify that I'm someone who can't go from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. Um, I need a little break between, or I need, uh, you know, after research conversations, I want to be able to take a step back. And you also might at this point talk about uh, ways that you can communicate um, if someone in your team needs a break on the side. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we um, that we wanted to include is just uh, some of the self reflection and examination tools that are that are already out there, and there are some really really great ones. So um, the first one is this uh, you know Kellyanne McCurcher's model of care for co design. 
Um, you can also see some images for um, the racial equity created by Alvin Sheck Snyder, um, the Designer's Critical Alphabet from Leslie Ann Noel, and the Equity Center Community Design Guide from Creative Reaction Lab. Um, these are just a, a, these are kind of like my primary go-tos for things that I might use either in the classroom or that I use and just thinking about and reflecting and just incorporating into like how, how I might do design. Yes. Um, and then this, this last one here, this like may seem pretty obvious, but sometimes we need a reminder that it's okay to take a break when we need it. Um, you know, uh, set, set team agreements or a code word for if you're feeling triggered or overwhelmed or oversaturated. And then also we want to make sure that we're being thoughtful about the way we debrief, debrief, like, especially after maybe an intense conversation or a session, you might want to take a break and wait a day or more for folks to process and come back um, and have those conversations. Yeah, and, you know, I also want to note that um, we talk a lot about the importance of establishing trust with people that we are designing with or for, um, but it is, it is, crucial and critical to have this trust within our teams. And sometimes that just does not exist. Um, I've experienced that myself. I've heard that from um, just dozens of people um, from around the world. Um, uh, and I wanna share you know, something that my, my friend and colleague, Matt Bernius from Code for America told um, just earlier this week at AIGADC's.gov conference. Um, he was talking about how he was um, unexpectedly triggered while in a research interview recently. And he had to slack his coworker to take over for a few minutes so that he could just simply catch his breath. So I, I just, I, I love that he shared this story because, um, especially as a, you know, a, 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 a white male, um, to, to just, you know, admit that, you know, publicly uh, can sometimes take, uh, you know, be a bit more vulnerable. Um, but he really impressed upon this importance of like backing one another up and being able to step up and step in for one, for one, for each other when, um, and sometimes this is just necessary in the work that we do. So we wanted to include that as well. Yeah. So the third one is to design for trauma and recover. So much recovery, much of what we've shared today is applicable across a range of projects, but um, when we're designing for survivors of trauma or, or, or for navigating trauma, it's important to understand sort of the presence of that and how it impacts their the survivor's journey towards recovery. So I will go through this um, pretty quickly because this is uh, this is uh, this is sort of like design des inside design. <laughs> um, so let me just click to the next slide here. So we must keep in mind that when it comes to trauma, whether, uh, you know, whatever we're designing is part of a person's larger healing journey. Uh, we see our role as one that supports things moving forward, um, but the journey isn't actually the simple. Um, it's not just a simple A to B. Um, you know, in reality, rec the recovery journey um, may feel more like this with like twists and turns and setbacks and jumps ahead. Um, but there are some evidence-based practices that we as designers can consider. So I'm going to share a model that's an adap adaptation from a book called Trauma and Recovery that's written by Judith Herman. Uh, Judith Herman is a Harvard researcher who's widely respected, though not without controversy, in the field. Um, and we can keep in mind, actually, that research shows that there are three overarching stages of recovery from trauma. So the first phase of recovery is that a person needs to feel safe. Um, but if safety is established, they can begin to process the trauma alone or with the help of, you know, through talk therapy, writing or storytelling, art and other mind body modalities. And then the third phase is to reconnect with ordinary life. So and, and that's really a spectrum of what that could mean. Um, it might mean that someone with severe PTSD um, feels comfortable navigating a trip to the grocery store, or it might mean a survivor of domestic violence like becomes an advocate for others. So reconnection um, kind of has, a, has a, um, a, a wide range here. And it's also important to note that these things can kind of happen in any order. Um, but as a design tool, this, ab this is an abstracted framework. And 
you know, it can be helpful for designers for us to check ourselves um, and put and potential solutions that we may be um, working with to think more deeply about the context of trauma that these design solutions live in. That means that we should both, you know, consider the intended and unintended consequences that come along with designing in this space or with a in, in a certain space or with a certain population. So here's a quick example of what I mean. So, you know, um, consider the ways in which an experience um, tools or services that we're that that you might be designing in a project might how are those impacting a person's safety you know is this is this a is this accessible uh, and equitable to all who need it uh, could people choose to interact with it anonymously if they wanted to uh, have you know have survivors of trauma been a part of the design process or have they helped to identify red flags uh, you know, how might someone who's grieving or processing experience uh, the thing that, you know, the, the design, you know, are we, can, are we able to connect that person to supportive services if needed? Um, how are we communicating or storytelling in a way that's supportive? Is it triggering? Um, what resources or education need to be made available in this moment? And lastly, you know, does does this empower or enable connection uh, in 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 the in ways that are appropriate? Uh, is outreach appropriate? Is is connection to community something that that should be considered in uh, in the design? And are there or are there opportunities for activism or active activism or advocacy or volunteer support? So, I also just want to say that we as designers. We're really good at simplifying things uh, that can be so that they can be understood. Like this, this one, two, three step might seem very straightforward and simple. This this framework is taking something that's very compl uh, complicated and simplifying it for the sake of discussion. So, however, this framework, you know, it's an oversimplification, and it's not one size fits all, because actually, much like the trauma journey. You know, much like the repercussions of trauma, this journey is not as straightforward. These three phases can be experienced again and again in any order or magnitude throughout a person's journey towards recovery or throughout their lives. Um, so each person's journey through trauma and, and, and towards recovery from trauma is unique. And we must take care not to overly simplify the reality of how the systems, structures, and design solutions play out within the context of people's lives. Um, whether they're recovering from past trauma, living with the ripple effects of that trauma or currently experiencing trauma. So again, like I feel like as a designer stepping into this space, I'm really just scratching the surface of what it is to know about this subject and about trauma. Um, and it's going to be an ongoing task for, uh, to learn um, throughout careers. So in closing, we want to just a, a few more minutes and then we're going to transition to questions. So we have our, our third and final poll. Um, so now that you've reached this point, how confident do you feel in responding to trauma if or when it does show up in the context of design? Give it a couple more seconds here. So the numbers have shifted a little bit, you know, from from just you know about an hour and a half ago. Um, it looks like uh, you know the the numbers for hopeful but uncertain um, actually went down a little bit, um, and then the numbers for feeling um, confident um, went up. Um, and we have one uh, trauma expert, and in, in uh, I'm curious to know who that person was. So a few um, a few takeaways that we want to share. Um, one of the things that has often come up with in conversations that um, that Mary and I have had, that we've had with others, that others have had with us, is this: you know, am I am I doing this the right way? Like there, like now that there's this. Um, awareness that there is this, uh, you know, potential framework that can be applied in the context of design. There's this, uh, there's this worry of like, okay, now I know that we need to be doing this, and I did not know that we were just not even paying attention to this. Now, am I doing it the right way? 
So we have a handful of takeaways to just um, to, to think about. Um, the first one is really just you being here for all of you who registered and who might be watching this on the video, uh, on the recording, those of you who are still with us, um, just you being here and getting started, um, it really is enough. Um, however, it's enough for now. And I think that these are um, these are practices that really need to that you need to keep practicing and you need to keep learning. Um, I think Mary and I like we, we demonstrate that that's one of the reasons why we talked um, like so much on the front end about our journey into this work and our experiences with this, even with this combined um, amount of experience, like we're still learning and we're still practicing these things. Um, number two, so takeaway number two, um, trauma-informed design really needs to be conceptualized in the context of positionality and intersectionality. Um, and if you, if these words are maybe new or you haven't heard about them or you'd like to revisit them, um, like you're kind of like channeling back to maybe like a sociology class that you might have taken, um, I really encourage you to look at, and we'll include this in the resources, um, positionality and the work that Leslie and Noel is doing and the work um, from Kimberly Crenshaw on intersectionality. Um, like these are like critical pieces. And once you really start to like, you know, take in some of this understanding, it's gonna be really hard to, to ignore it. Um, takeaway number three is that systemic issues of oppression really need to be centered in trauma work rather than relegated to the margins as side issues. Um, we really have to look at the root causes to the best of our ability. Takeaway number four, um, if you're new to building your trauma literacy, which it, I get the sense that, uh, that a majority of you who are here today are, um, engage and participate in this work with humility and curiosity and just a, a genuine desire to learn. Takeaway number five, um, do the necessary work to process personal traumatic experiences so that we can center our clients and our partners and our communities and the design work that we do. Um, I recognize that this is uh, much easier said than done, just even being, just saying these words as a social worker, I'm much more comfortable saying this, um, but I, this is something that has like literally come up in every single conversation that I've had with someone um, and, and how we can uh, talk about this and, and work on this is really going to influence how we do design. And then the last one is design a self-care, um, a trust and, and design self-care, trust and compassion into your team dynamic. So build in time to process. So sometimes you might need to process like throughout the entire process. Sometimes we need to, you know, we, we typically just default to like at the end of a project, but what if we did that at the beginning? Um, cultivate habits, rest and recovery and healing. Um, this talked about often. Um, so I hear the hear the sentiment, but I times like I see of this actually being supported happen like challenge your leaders. And if you need help challenging your leaders, um, like you know, reach out to us. Yeah. Um you were breaking up a little bit. And there, this I last think. one is you know trust yourself and just know Hey, Rachel, I'm going to step in because I think you're breaking up a little bit there. But the third part of this is to trust yourself and, and know your boundaries, um, you know, because you are in this work and you need to be able to recognize if you need a break. Looks like we lost Rachel. There you are. You're back. I'm back. I, I, I froze and didn't know it. Okay. It's okay. You, we, we heard most of what you said. Yay. Okay. Um, the, this really, the last two slides here are just um, sharing that we're going to, we will share a list of resources to everyone who signed up and everyone who attended. So you can see like a, a, a little like preview of some of the things that we will include. Um, and then, yeah, then, uh, you know, in case anyone wants to keep in touch with us or get a hold of us, here's our contact information. You can screenshot us or, or whatever, reach out to us on LinkedIn um, or, or through email. And the um, reason we wanted to share this now is we're going to take the, I'm going to stop sharing screen and um, we can start moving into the Q&A. A second here to stop sharing. Great. Thank you so much, Mary and Rachel, for sharing your work with us. I believe it's really important for us as designers to think about this 
And I think we're all walking away from this with both learning something new and a lot to mull over. Um, and thanks to our attendees for sharing some insightful comments in the chat, as well as questions. So we have about 20-ish minutes left. So um, my colleague, Nicolette and I will start going through some of those questions. And so our first question is, how can designers rethink expertise and who holds the power, which was modified from the chat? Mm. Mary, we're staring at each other. I know. You, do you want to take it? It's funny. We, we've been talking a lot about these, like, the, these power dynamics and how we can start to um, identify you know, what our own biases are and how um, power dynamics come into play. Um, you know, I think part of that for me is self-reflection. And I also think back to actually one of the tools that we shared, there's just like a really great self-reflection activity in there. I think it's it's from this one. There's a, a great activity around um, about analyzing the power, uh, power dynamics going into something. So like there's questions to ask yourself and reflect on like, you know, what forms of power are helpful um, uh, to myself and others, how and why, or what forms of power are in the same, you know, what forms of power are harmful? Um, are there any forms of power which are given to me or power that I can give to myself or power that I can give to someone else? Um, and so, I don't know, this, this is actually uh, really, I, I went to one of their workshops and did uh, the power dynamic uh, conversation and I found it really insightful. And also for me, just personally, just thinking about um, where I do have, where, where does my power lie? Where do I have permission um, to sort of use that power? And where should I just step back and make sure that I am making space and leaving room for other people to um, take the stage and, and lead? I think one small thing that I would add to what Mary just said, which was just like fantastic, is this, I, I, I have a hard time seeing power um, outside of the context of understanding your own earned and unearned privilege. Um, and I really think that that is, that that could be built in and be part of that, um, part of that like self-reflection and part of that assessment as well. Mm -hmm. I've got a question for you. Um, when do you know you're trauma informed? So when when are you kind of um, confident enough in your skill set to know that you're trauma informed? Hmm. That's a good question because I think I think before you know I'll I'll, I'll speak from like personal and then um, then more generally, um, I. I think after I got a, an actual trauma certification, I realized how, how ill-equipped I was as a, um, a, a decades in like a social worker um, doing some of this work. And so um, some of that might be my own, um, you know, just struggles with, uh, you know, like humility and just owning what I, what I do know at times. Um, but I think that there's something to be said about, uh, you know, I, I see it as more of a, um, I see it more as a practice and something that is just continually evolving, um, something that can be built upon. Um, and then just building on what do you know now at this moment and how are you applying what you know now um, to the design process or design project at hand? Um, and if uh, if there if there really is strong trust and rapport within it within a design team, um, like that that there's going to be like open and honest you know respect that is not going to tear people down or traumatize them. It'll actually like it'll build them up and it's going to make them stronger as an individual, but also stronger as a team. Um, so I you know I I have seen a I have seen a couple of um of models where there's a um and I know that at the national level this is something that is being looked at um it's just like what what does like a continuum of being trauma-informed actually look like um you know is there trauma there, there's trauma awareness there's being trauma-informed there's trauma responsiveness trauma consciousness 
like I personally prefer, um, we use the word trauma informed a lot in this presentation. I, I personally prefer trauma responsive because I feel like it, that's more of a, an embodied um, kind of mindful consciousness approach um, and that uh, looking at it at all, um, in all aspects of what you might do. Um, so I, I think it's, um, I, I really think there's a, a comfort level that's going to come with actually taking in the information and then having that safe space to actually apply it. It's the, the application is, is critical to be able to practice and to just keep improving upon. Yeah, I wish I would, there is a like, you know, like, hey, like, you know, that you've arrived after like four weeks, you know, it, it, like that is not the answer. You know, we combined between Mary and I, we probably have what nearly 50 years of experience combined. And we feel like we're still kind of like scratching the surface. But uh, but, you know, but it's it's a it's a journey. It's it's very much like recovery from trauma, to be honest. I would agree with I would agree with that. Uh, yeah, we are just scratching the surface. The surface. Um, when you were talking, it did make me think about you know wh what it means to be sort of trauma informed when you're practicing as a designer. And I think a lot about um, service design. So when we're designing these experiences that people interact with, um, when something's trauma informed or trauma aware, I, I think of it as like how what are those like ways that people are interacting with this service in a space is that sort of trauma awareness sort of sprinkled throughout the entire organization. Um, for example, if someone is to walk in the front door of some place that is trauma informed, you know, even the person at the front desk would have a bit of knowledge and a lens on how to respond if someone was in crisis or if someone was experiencing trauma. Um, or even if the, you know, like I've, I've, uh, we're in working with uh, some services that are, are helping young people experiencing homelessness. Like we've talked about even it within the shelter, like even um, the facilities person being trauma informed so that, that they're, they're the person who's there that they can respond. And so I, I don't know, I feel like the more trauma informed is, is, is um, for me about sharing that awareness and embedding that awareness into our work, but also like all of us kind of practicing and learning that knowledge as we go. Great. And to kind of build on that, um, the trauma-informed care principles talk a lot about what you were talking about with um, front frontline staff. Um, and one question we received was thinking more about the funders. So how might you incorporate a trauma-informed approach with clients or funders of design work? Mm. I, you know, there are some examples. I probably can't explicitly share them just yet. Hopefully they can be, um, you know, future case studies and in, uh, in, in future uh, either presentations or workshops. Um, but I, I know of, I'm, I'm in some earlier stages of involvement with, a, with two separate projects where that is explicitly being considered um, because, uh, because the, how the money is being flowed to this particular project um, is really um, is really going to impact the sustainability of it, you know, for the long haul. Um, and so um, I know that there's also there there are some you know like just structural agencies like United Way, for an example, that has a, you know a, a local presence for the most part around the country, um, has a, you know national offices, regional offices. Um, these are some things that they're that they're starting to really look at because they 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 often act as a, a primary funder at least on a county or on a community level for local agencies and might also be partnering with you know um, design studios or design um, agencies as well. So um, I I think it's happening um, and I think it's probably happening more than than we might be aware of. I just don't think we're hearing the the explicit stories and case examples of of how that's happening. Um, so that's uh, makes makes me think of like how can we how can we elevate that so that Pete so there is like a heightened awareness on that. I've got another question for you. Um, do you think that corporations could or should create trauma informed training for creative and marketing departments, similar to sensitivity training or sexual harassment training? Hmm. Uh, short answer is um, absolutely yes. <laughs> 
Um, the fact that uh, that they don't that that does not currently exist um, is um, disappointing at best. Um, I, again, like I kind of I made a subtle reference to this being looked at at the at the federal level. Um, there, there really is a there's a, an interagency task force that's looking at how can we actually roll out um, uh, you know, trauma informed care practices and principles um, throughout at least all of the federal agencies. And so if you look at um, if you look at just at, at that level, that would have a pretty, pretty significant impact on just like the the the, the broader like, you know, people who live in the United States. Um, I but you know, that's. I, you know, but corporations and, and creative, uh, you know, um, studios and marketing departments are, aren't uh, like, they don't have to necessarily sometimes play by those federal rules. I think so much of this comes down to um, leadership will. Um, that's something that has come up um, quite a bit, uh, just, you know, even anecdotally in just uh, doing nonprofit consulting over the past couple of decades that um, sometimes the the height of, of where you can, or the depth that you can go for some of this work is going to be, it's going to peak at like the willingness and the desire of like your top leadership in a particular agency. Um, that can be um, amazing and something to celebrate depending on where you are, or that can be extremely detrimental and just be um, you know kind of soul crushing for individuals who are wanting to spearhead and incorporate this kind of work. Um, you know, there currently isn't, you know, national legislation that enforces this or that mandates it. And, and I don't know if I would um, even recommend going that route. Um, but I do think that, uh, I think if there was a desire internally for corporations and private entities to, to take this on and to invest in this and not just a, a one or two hour workshop, but actually really like cultivate a very strong awareness that is like guiding these practices, improving them, setting standards and, uh, and just championing this as a, as, as a, a way of doing, um, I think it, it, would, it would fundamentally shift how we are doing any kind of work. And it would fundamentally shift how, how uh, the people who are on the uh, receiving end of either good or bad design are receiving that. Um, the, I think the, I'm going to, I'm going to quote, uh, you know, Vivian Castillo and something that she said in a recent conversation she and I had, and that, uh, you know, the future of the employee experience needs to be trauma informed. And I could not agree uh, more wholeheartedly. Um, and the, the, the fact that uh, that isn't explicit, um, especially now, like 14 months in, um, in a pandemic is, uh, is a, is a bit surprising. Mm -hmm. I will just add to that and say that I was actually really inspired. One of the clients that I was um, able to work with in the past year, uh, they're a, a very large like, uh, nonprofit who have you know, feet in Chicago, other parts of America and overseas. Um, they have made a commitment to make sure their entire organization is trauma informed. And so they were starting to roll out, you know, it was a lot of video trainings and things. And I was able to, you know, to take some of those classes, but just, just to try mm. and get, they wanted to just raise the baseline of having their entire organization to be trauma aware. And I just thought that I was so impressed with that. And, you know, I think they're implementing other programs to try and do that. So I know they had partnered with some outside organizations and I'd have to dig to remember who that was, but I know it's starting to happen at least in some spaces and that's really exciting. Yeah, that is. All right, another question for you. What, um, what have you done? So after you engage people in a co-design process, uh, is there anything that you've done for aftercare or an extension of care that was extended during the co-design process after participation has ended? That's a good question. Mary, do you have some, you might have some specific examples from some of the reproductive um, justice work. Well, I can think of one particular example. Um, of an individual that was in one of the sessions um, who actually shared with me some personal stuff about what they were going through and they needed a specific type of care and they needed access to a specific type of medication. And so what, um, 
what what we were able to do, what I was able to do was to get a hold of our, our partners who happened to be on site that day, our partners who were medical providers and say, can you see this person today? Like, can we connect this person with care right now? And it, absolutely, we made it happen. And so that person was able to get um, to get what they needed in like in that same day. So that was, I think, a great example of when it, it worked well. And we were, you know, very fortunate to have a, a like a, a like a, a mobile health unit, a doctor's office, tour mm -hmm. bus on wheels, um, accessible to us on that particular day as well. So things worked out. Yeah, that's a good example, especially when you're doing work that might be in more of a healthcare context, or you're explicitly partnering with a social service agency, I would, um, I would hope, um, I would hope that there, some of those resources um, would be available, um, a, at least a little bit easier. It makes me think about um, just some of the, the healthcare for homeless veterans work at the VA. Um, you know, even though, you know, our team had, you know, set schedules that varied from like 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m., Sometimes people were working weekend shifts. Um, there was a whole other like secondary team, you know, that wasn't the healthcare for homeless veterans team. There's a whole secondary team where um, if there is a more complex situation, like I would get called in or I would get called to like maybe like triage it over the phone. Uh, but um, I think, you know, thinking about those, um, those, you know, sometimes are called like social safety nets or thinking about those like those, those structural programs that exist that can, that would be able to provide that kind of aftercare, either like literally after hours or like that continuous or that continuum of care that might happen like days after, um, after the fact. So I think we're just about at time. Do we have time for maybe one more quick question or, uh, what do you think, Catherine and Nicolette? Yeah, I think we can do one more. Um, so one question that came in was when trauma does show up on our team, what are some approaches for addressing it in real time? Mm. I think the story that Rachel, you told about, about the, the conversation where someone, you know, had to have someone take over for them um, is, is a great example of that. I think that, communication for me I think um, communication ahead of time and just knowing you mm -hmm. know maybe having an agreement um, uh, I remember on a project I had a you know we had had this conversation ahead of some pretty um, intense research uh, conversations uh, we we'd sort of said you know this might be difficult um, someone had identified that they might definitely need a break afterwards and as we were leaving um, you know, I, I looked to them and saw their face was sort of, you know, ha, ha, they had this this sort of look on their face and I said, do you, you know, do you need a break? And they just shook their head and I said, can you talk? And they said, no. And so we kind of navigated what did they need in that moment to just sort of like, let's just go um, and step over. We're outside. Let's just like go step away. Um, I'm here if you need me, but like, let's just like, sort of take a few minutes to just be um, and calm down from that. And, and we were able to do that, I think, um, well, because we had talked about it ahead of time and knew to sort of have each other's backs. There's, um, that's, you know, what you're sharing, Mary, makes me think about this, this great book um, and this great resource called there's no good card for this. Um, and it was written by Emily McDowell, who um, is, a, is a, an illustrator and uh, you know, she, she, makes, uh, she makes cards. Um, she goes by M and Friends now, E-M and Friends, and, um, and Kelsey Crow. So Kelsey Crow is a, is a social worker um, and has a, a company called um, the Empathy, the Empathy uh, I think it's called the Empathy Lab. And in this book, they talk about, you know, these, these like really difficult conversations and difficult situations that might come up and how, um, you know, more often than not, like one of the responses that we have is just to either freeze or we over talk, or then we start sharing like our situation. We kind of take away from like that person that's being centered in that moment. Um, there is some fantastic practical advice that's in that. We'll, we'll include that in our, in our uh, list of uh, resources too. Um, I really think um, 
although I am so like against um, like the uh, your role playing, I do think that there's value in role playing some of these scenarios ahead of time so that you can at least get a little bit comfortable and over some of that those initial um, like discomfort um, with 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 practicing and kind of like rolling with that discomfort as it actually comes up in real time. Um, like just, I, I, you know, like what Mary said, um, making, you know, like saying like, hey, I need to step away, like trying to talk about something afterwards. If you know that you are going to have, um, if you're working on just a subject matter that's fairly difficult, um, not having scheduled back-to-back -back interviews is like, is, is crucial. I think we take advantage of everyone's availability and time and just Zoom because we think that we can do it. Like, let's just fill everything. Let's default to the hour. Um, build in, I'd say at least an hour. Some people need like two or more hours. Like some people are just, they're highly sensitive and deeply empathic themselves. So they need extra time just to process that. Um, I think a, a lot of people are drawn to this work because they are deeply empathic. Um, and just like, just own that and recognize that and, uh, you know, and, and honor like what your own needs might be. Thank you. Well, I see that it is, it just turned 6.01 oh, I know. on my side. So, so um, we want to thank everyone for being here today and thank everyone who's helped and everyone who asked questions. Um, this is, you know, a, a, a subject matter that is something that, you know, we're thinking about all the time and, and have, uh, I know that I have plenty of room for improvement and, and lots of things to learn. And I'm just so grateful um, that everyone joined us today. Please reach out if you have any questions and we will be in contact with you with um, supportive uh, resources and, and, and links after this. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Okay, goodbye.